The following is a dialogue between Professor Ole G. Morrison, a pioneer within gastrophysics, and history professor John R. Gillis, who has been researching the interfaces between land and sea for the last 20 years. Well, let us start with a fond memory. That is uh, your visit to a small island off the coast of Maine called Great God Island. And um, <clears throat> I remember your uh, waiting in our, in our pools uh, with your waders on, uh, drawing uh, seaweed that we um, had not appreciated out of those pools. And then conversations followed from that about the importance of, of, of seaweed and also um, various forms of shellfish and fish for human evolution. And that got me, as a historian, thinking uh, more seriously than I had about the contribution of the, of the shore to human evolution and led to uh, my study of uh, the human shore beginning uh, about 164,000 years ago at least. Um, I think one place to uh, think about this is the the expanding importance of shores to history and geography. They had been little considered um, uh, until recently, but now they've, they've gained a prominence in our uh, historical and geographical thinking. Um, they're no longer neglected. They, in fact, are coming to the forefront of our understanding of human activity and, and human evolution. Um, and I attribute that all to you, we had a great time at the little island. It was really a paradise for someone who loves the nature and in particular these strange creature, creatures out there, the, the seaweeds. And I still remember, and I thank you greatly for you, actually, you sat through a whole breakfast eating my lava bread, which I've been cooking yes. for four hours. Yes. Which yes. is sort of a very traditional dish in, 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 uh, in Europe and Ireland. It was, it was taken over to New England by, by the settlers. And you can still sort of find uh, reminiscences of that various places. And I, so, so we had a great breakfast meal. It was probably very different from the one you, you usually have. We usually have pancakes with <laughs> lava bread. But, you know, those, uh, those traditions have been brought to America. And then they've been forgotten. I mean, people forget um, whole species. On our island, um, people didn't rediscover the, the mussel beds until the 1980s and 1990s. Unfortunately now, um, another form of evolution, the green crab, has destroyed the, uh, the mussel beds. But the point being here is that uh, the shores are in incredibly variable. They're intensely historical. They're easily forgotten. And uh, one of my quests in this book, uh, um, The Human Shore, is to bring shores back into historical memory and show just how important they've been as, as interfaces. And certainly the creatures that live at the shore is something we quite often overlook, even though they're sort of usually the place where we got a lot of our food stuff from. And, and speaking about forgotten history, yes. the seaweeds is really a forgotten history in, in, in the western part of the world and certainly in Europe. And there are only very few places where there's a historical record of people actually using the seaweeds mm. and and also there's a living tradition about it. And that is what I'm trying to unveil in my book on seaweeds to open people's eyes for this wonderful resource of uh, foodstuff, which is out there, which is very precious because it contains nutrients that ends up in the fish and the shellfish, which is very important for, for our, our nutrition. And it's interesting with this kind of uh, uh, foodstuff, which doesn't leave any trace of being used, because in mm. contrast to bones and scales from fish, mm -hmm. you can see that people have worked on them, and you can find them in mittens. Uh, seaweeds, they just go. I mean, they're soft mm -hmm. material, they just rot mm -hmm. and off they go. Yeah. And those places where you actually find it in, in, in uh, dwellings, um, you can't really tell whether people use them for, as firewood or actually mm -hmm. for food. But uh, I, would, uh, I would claim, and, and I don't know how you think about that no. as a historian, but I would claim that it's the burden of those who said that people didn't need it yes. to prove that that's the case, because that would be the most unlikely. <laughs> because yes, I mean, yes. as you also write in your book, yep. people at the shores, they will harvest whatever they could find, and it's part of their nutrition. It's actually also been part of the, the, the evolution. Yes. Well, uh, the great 
Berkeley geographer, um, Carl Sauer, uh, wrote in the 1960s that the shore is the original home of, of humankind. And uh, this was greeted with a great deal of skepticism at the time. Um, and uh, one of my quests is to uh, validate, uh, if not prove, that, uh, uh, that thesis, that the original home of mankind, uh, the place uh, not just of, of uh, physical evolution, of brain evolution, but also of cultural uh, evolution, is, is the shore. And to um, revise the notion that everything has to happen inland, um, we are a, a very land lubberly uh, society. Uh, even uh, places like Denmark, so close to the sea, are largely land lubberly today. But we need to we need to recapture the importance of the shore in this respect. And shore, I, in your book, you describe. I mean, you talk about shore. You talk about coast and coastlines as something that is sort of something that is comes at certain times of, of, and certain periods that someone may draw a chart or a map and certainly there's a line but it's not really there in nature and it's much more complex it's certainly not just a <coughs> boundary line it's it's a region it's a margin where there's a lot of activity yep. and that's something that appeals yes. to me as a natural mm -hmm. scientist a physicist because mm -hmm. in in our world of our of describing both the, the 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 material world both the living world and 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 and, and the dead materials um, interfaces and boundaries, that's actually where almost all of the action is. If you just think about the earth, I mean, what shapes our earth is uh, volcanic activity, mm -hmm. the whole climate is really an interfacial phenomenon. Uh, you have differences in temperatures and mm -hmm. currents that mm -hmm. sort of restructures and, and dynamically forms the earth. Mm -hmm. But most people don't realize that actually we as living beings, we talk to each other here, we all the activity, yes. we, we expose even the cognitive yes. ability is bound to interfaces in our body. I mean, we are really sort of a bunch of interfaces uh, that in, at which all the activity is sitting. And these interfaces have different names and different parts of the sciences that describe natural sciences. And, and in, the, in the biological sciences and life sciences, we talk about interfaces and, and membranes and, and mm -hmm. structures mm -hmm. that that partition mm -hmm. a complex organism like mm -hmm. us, and it's not only dividing two sides, but it's also have its own life, yes, and yes. which is yeah. uh, Im impacting on the two sides. It's, mm -hmm. it, it's dividing, but also has its sort of own own dynamics. Yeah, well, this uh, is so important to my my work because I'm trying to do this uh, not on the uh, molecular scale as you are, or on the um, uh, on the scale of, of nature, but I'm trying to do it in a sociological and cultural way. So for me, the shore is, um, is not a line you step over uh, or, or transcend, but it is a place you enter into. And I'm trying to recapture the importance of, of the shore as interface where uh, things happen. And in my case, it is, um, uh, it is not quite uh, a, uh, the way things happen in your natural uh, sciences. But it certainly is a place where there, the interaction between species, for example, um, is very important. And the interaction between different peoples is equally important. The shore is where um, uh, various uh, peoples first encountered one another, and those encounters have been incredibly important uh, to history, both positive and negative, let's face it. Uh, but that is where things happen. But I, I think that picture carries over beautifully to the natural sciences because, I mean, interfaces have sort of their own life because they, they are these boundaries, but they have different properties that depends uh -huh. on what, yeah. what are on the two sides. And, and in, in your language, I would say if you have a, a system, and you will talk about people and coast and lands. In, in, in the physical world, we will talk about materials and faces, mm -hmm. and then some could be molecules or other agents mm -hmm. that sit in these systems, and they become indirectly attracted to the interface because of the multi, uh, multi uh, the, 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 the different forces that act in this system. So in a way, these agents, you can think of them as people. In my world, I can think of them as proteins or yes. pumps or something that yes. molecular machines that does something. 
they're expelled from the different regions towards the interface. So mm -hmm. effectively, the interface, mm -hmm. call it the shore or mm -hmm. boundary, it attracts these mm -hmm. impurities, the particles. Right. And in, in biology, those particles, impurities, people in your world, that they're, they're the ones that carry activity. It could be the receptor we're now using when we mm -hmm. look at each other, the receptor that sits in an interface, a retina and yes, a membrane, yes, yes. and its function is yeah. intimately controlled of that interface. Yes. And uh, for, for, for better and worse, because um, some of these molecules that sit in the interface, they have to come together to provide some action. Yes. It could be some yes. of them that had to bind in order for a process to happen, yeah, yeah, that's, but they that's, could also be that they yes. come to, yeah. together yeah. and actually have a, a, a terminal effect on the system. Mm -hmm. And in fact, the whole field of, of pharmacology or uh, you're studying drugs, most drugs, they actually work on interfaces. Mm -hmm. And they do something to these agents, mm -hmm. molecules, mm -hmm. that sit in the interface, make them bind mm -hmm. or unbind or change the structure. Mm -hmm. And that's actually the way uh, the environment in terms of, of medicine interact with the human being. But it need not be medicine, it could be also be food. Because mm -hmm. food has the same mm -hmm. sort of capability, it has to cross interfaces. We eat something, mm -hmm. it goes into the stomach and intestines, passes across yes. in one yes. interface, and another interface goes into the blood. Mm -hmm. Suppose it's a, a, a nutrient that eventually has to make it to the mm -hmm. brain, it travels around, it has to cross another interface. Mm -hmm. And this is this crossing of this interface is, a, is an active mm -hmm. process. It's not something that is yes, passive, it's good. an active it's good. process. Yeah. 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 Well, this is so redolent of uh, what I think we should be thinking about it in, um, in history. The, the attractions of, of shores and coasts uh, is enormous, and uh, uh, no one has really uh, tried to explain why uh, millions of people each year go down to a, um, an interface, if you want to look at it that way, uh, an interface which for, uh, for many thousands of years has been avoided uh, as a place of repulsion rather than attraction. And now um, the shore is the most attractive uh, place on earth. It's the yes. highest property values. And the most pleasure is derived from the visit to the shore, to the beach. And uh, this requires some explanation. Now, whether the explanation can be modeled on your interface um, idea uh, is another question, but there's no doubt that if we we thought of humans as molecules, um, they would be this kind of coming together at the at the interface of the shore would be a, a wonderful metaphor for, for what goes on. And then of course there's also the one thing is that these molecules of human beings go to the shore, but the shore is affected by the presence yes, of the oh and this yes. is of course what yes. is, yes. is uh, both fascinating, fascinating, but also devastating in terms yep. of environmental conditions, and yep, it also carries over in some of the yep. physical sciences that that these agents of the interface they can ruin the interface. It could be a surface mm -hmm. that has certain property, uh -huh. and then certainly doesn't yep. have those properties any longer. It may corrode, or yep. Yep. it may not have mm -hmm. the function you want. On the other hand, in the physical sciences, it may be different. In the, in the cultural, in the cultural science, you may not that easily manipulate. Because yes. what, of course, what we do in the sciences, we if we understand some of these principles, we have mm -hmm. ways of manipulating the surface or interface. Mm -hmm. And you can imagine in technology mm -hmm. how one can use this to provide mm -hmm. uh, catalysts that can provide cleaner air, or you may have surfaces yes, of, yes. of buildings that that like, cleans themselves because yeah. you know oh. how to so, sort of yes. these agents not to stick at the interface, but rather go into the air yeah. or. Or somewhere else, uh, but in, in the terms of, 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 of humans being yeah. on a shore, I mean, we we we've seen. I've been traveling a lot of Japan, and I really feel extremely depressed when I oh. see all this walling oh, of yes. rivers yes. and coastlines, and all these sort of the original mm -hmm. um, aspects of a coast that changes over time, for better and worse. Yes. That's really people try to shield them. From this, although yes, of course yes. it won't be successful. Hiding long behind long. the wall, yes. the seawall. I'm very interested in that concept because the it's clear that the uh, 2011 tsunami uh, damage was uh, heightened by the nature of the of the construction of those seawalls and the harbors and the 
the narrow um, entryways that cause the, uh, the forces of the flow to multiply mm -hmm. and become so much more destructive as it got beyond uh, the, the seawall into, the, um, into the interior. So you're absolutely right. The, the, uh, um, we used to think of, um, of the shore and certainly the sea as uh, eternal, in, 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 even Rachel Carson used the term in, the incorruptible sea as if no amount of human um, interaction with it could ever change it. But now we know, uh, and the evidence is mounting up every day, that the sea is already uh, enormously changed, uh, particularly by acidification uh, and other atmospherics. So uh, the shore is always changing. Um, the coast is always changing. And uh, we, we need to catch up with that rate of change. Of course, what you're alluding to the fact is that we live in a finite system, a finite yes. world. It's not, the sea is not infinite. We've already discovered land is not infinite. Yes. And I yes. guess the first well as along the coast, they would just move on if uh, yeah. the tidal wave come, came or, or yeah, yes. the, the, the fish right. were gone and it was just infinite. They could walk along the coast. I would be very interested yeah. to, to hear your opinion about, I mean, when we really go that far back, there were very few people. Yes. And, yes. and um, in my sort of picture <laughs> of the image, I could see, and you alluded to that, that yeah. the fact that they would congregate on something that had a dimension that was lower than the dimension of land and sea, yes. they had a greater chance of meeting each other. Yes. And yes. I, I think this is a, a interesting also for, for a physical science to think of because the, the, when we talk about getting stuff to meet each other, uh, we would like to confine them to interface because if you imagine mm. if you had two mm. agents that had to meet, it would be two yeah. molecules that bind. If they had to do this randomly, <laughs> explore uh, yes. a, a sort of a two-dimensional space that's on the yeah. surface, it will take much longer than mm -hmm. if you confine them yeah. to an interface. Yeah. And I suppose this could have been a driving force for mm -hmm. creation of maybe uh, oh. f f certain families, people can sort yeah. of find partners and, and, yes. um, and may also have given rise to, to warfare, I guess, and conflicts. Well, uh, yes, yeah, so I, sp I suppose uh, you're referring to a population level that, of the hunter-gatherer uh, periods when there were very few people, um, they, uh, there was plenty of territory uh, and they could move. That was the way they avoided their own waste, for example, exactly. uh, their own diseases. They just move on. And that, of course, is impossible today. Some might dream of reducing population to levels uh, that would uh, allow us to move around the land again. But that uh, is really impossible. So we have to think up other devices, but um, this idea of, um, I'm, I'm not sure I quite understand the idea of, uh, of, of, uh, of reducing the number of places where, where um, uh, things or people could meet, uh, whether that, although clearly coasts and uh, shores have meeting places, the harbor, for example, right, right. Is one we designate certain uh, areas of the coast now as uh, for this or for that, for work or for leisure. We can find people, um, tell them uh, where they can go, where they can't go, um, and whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. That uh, that is our current condition. You know, you know. So where do you sort of see? the future of coast? I mean, will there be sort of, how much fashion is there in moving inland or toward the coast or on, on the sea? And how is our um, possibilities of sort of finding new ways of using the space, how are they actually, yeah. how are they now when we are increasing, rapidly increasing global population and not much, much space There's new the, left the, yeah. to explore, if any? Well, there's a lot of, I think it's wrong to say there isn't a lot of space. In fact, uh, there's vast empty spaces uh, awaiting uh, population colonization. The problem is nobody wants to go there um, and it would be too expensive to move people there, but we certainly can't afford further um, uh, densities on, on, on coasts that are already uh, so vulnerable. And so after uh, Katrina, after uh, tsunami, after uh, Hurricane Sandy, 
uh, people are, 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 are facing the fact that they uh, must uh, move back. In fact, they must move back uh, if those places are to survive. Um, and so uh, new architectures are being developed, as you probably know, uh, in the Netherlands and elsewhere, raising the level of houses, floating houses, making houses uh, more mobile. Uh, in the past, people floated their houses from one uh, side of the river to the other, to one island to another. Um, we're perfectly um, accepting of the idea of moving house uh, by water. Uh, there's no reason why that couldn't be uh, brought back into uh, uh, feasible uh, use again. You know, there are all kinds of... Uh, but, of course, <clears throat> the problem is that the, the shore has now become property. And once something becomes property, then it becomes immobile. It becomes a, a, a vested interest of someone or something. Uh, and it becomes very difficult under our legal systems uh, to... Uh, to make any changes in that system. That's, uh, that's the problem facing New Jersey, for example, today, where um, uh, a few people can hold up a whole a dune restoration uh, because they insist that their property gives them the right to see the, the water, and they're just not going to give up that right. And they sometimes are they infuriate their neighbors uh, by holding on to these precious property rights against the uh, interests of the community. That's and all this in, in, in the mind of historian, that's a very short time span. It sure I is. I guess, uh, looking over much longer time spans, I, I guess one would say, and I would also say that as a physical science, you can never build walls high enough. Eventually, it will be, <laughs> be a disaster. That's sort of a, you know, a scientific principle. There will always it eventually come a big disaster, yes. and, and it will sort of do away with whatever you try to avoid it. I mean, that's sort of the, what is called uh, self-organized criticality in, in my oh. language that oh. you probably know this from earthquakes. I mean, you know, yes. little earthquakes and bigger earthquakes and, and even if you try to take measures, it will always, at some states, you don't know when, yep. some states will come an event that is bigger than yes. the one you expected. <laughs> so so yep. in a longer perspective, I guess the, the coastlines, I mean, they will will have to change uh, uh, the, the, the area where we call coast, they will, will maybe be bigger, maybe smaller. Yeah. And, and we know over time, in earlier time, uh, there were, the water level was much, much lower than it yes. is now. And we know it's going to rise. It's, it's yes. certainly rising. And in the long run, yeah. and this is sort of very pessimistic, maybe, mm -hmm. <laughs> that you can't really build, build a wall that is high enough. No, you certainly the wall can't. Must be now, the wall, in fact, is not the solution, it's the problem. Uh, people, as you say, people rely on walls to protect them. Uh, this is uh, a long part of human evolution. Even the uh, early houses didn't have walls. Uh, so, but the, your, your very interesting point, if we could expand the notion of the shore to its original meaning, which was um, as a water land, that is, as far as the uh, as the tide reached, and sometimes uh, even even more extensively inland through estuaries and so on, out to out to uh, the immediate um, uh, shelves of of uh, crustaceans and seaweed and so on. Uh, if people understood the coast to be this capacious place, they wouldn't be so eager to crowd down onto the narrow edge. So the more we define the coast or the shore as an edge, the more problematic it becomes. It becomes that wall, which is then self-defeating, has to be constantly built up, destroyed, built up again, um, to enormous waste to the environment and to, to the society, actually. It's interesting. So now you mentioned the word kelp. I can't help sort of bring that <laughs> back because it's okay. sort of bringing us back to also to God's island and, yeah. and, the, and the wonders in, 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 in the ocean and on the coast, and on the shore, we, we're not using that much. In, the, in your book, you describe about the peopling of yes. the earth, yes. which sort of took roots that were most likely to be along yes. the coast. And, um, and, and there's, there's this very interesting, interesting concept of, of the combo or the kelp road. 
uh, along the uh, from the Beringa and down through the North American down to the South American continent. Yes, yes. That the peopling of these continents proceeded along the coast. Yes. And you can tell from the remains of the, the different excavations in southern Chile that people actually had a quite, uh, quite sophisticated uses of mm -hmm. these organisms along the coast, in particular the big kelps, the big seaweeds, uh, both for medicinal purposes but also for, for food purposes. So the, the uh, ability to find food and the ability to move and mm -hmm. not go into dangerous land or being on the yes. sea proceeded along, along the coast. Yes. And even more so, it's sort of um, mm -hmm. uh, interesting to uh, sort of revive um, the, the interest in using these organisms, which is almost non-existent in the Western world. Yes. Mostly just eat uh, some extracts of them, yeah, which is. we put in yogurts and juices and, and, and various kinds of food products. But, but they, there's a rich world out there, which is actually yeah. from the point of view of biology and production of organic material. That's the biggest. I mean, all the yes, algae the to which yes. all the algae to which the, mm -hmm. the seaweeds yeah. belong, they produce by far the largest mm -hmm. amount of organic material, and there's lots of it, and it's along all coastal areas, mm -hmm. in all on all in all climatical zones, and isn't it sort of amazing that it's, we're not using it? Well, well again, in the east, of course, they're not forgotten, and that's sort of that's the sort of you know, question I, I I would yes. have. It. Quite often asked when I meet historians and archaeologists, I mean, how, how, how come that people forget? Yes. And in, in, and 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 uh, quite yeah. often I hear one of the answers is that when you have changes in people's tradition, it's quite often hmm. imposed by a new power structure. That is, mm -hmm. you make it a new religion or a new yes. ruler, and the way to impose on the people hmm. is to tell them. You have to change your customs, change your clothes, or change the way you're eating, change the way you organize yourself. That's a way of exerting power. Yes. So some of the some of the suggestions I've heard why people in our part of the world don't eat these organisms any longer is that at some states it's it being considered as a pagan thing, something yes. that yes. certainly was not uh, commensurate yeah. with, with, with Christianity. Yes. Uh, and. Uh, and, uh, and, and, uh, and even though probably the new rulers and, 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 and whoever came in and wanted to rule, mm -hmm. they had nothing against seaweeds as such, yes. but it's a way of demonstrating, <laughs> do away with this, because you have to, this is not allowed any longer. And we see that repeatedly in many different religions, it's a way of ex uh, sort of exerting power over people. So well, how yes, this, yes. How no, this no, that, that works. Way of thinking? It works very well. I mean, look, in, in Europe, um, in the medieval period, power was vested in land. Therefore, the, the lords of the land uh, were very reluctant to allow uh, their peasants even to go down to the shore, or they would allow them periodically when the fish were running. But no, they didn't want to, they didn't want to lose this labor source, and they certainly didn't want to lose the, uh, the symbolic power that the land had. So uh, while there was certainly a demand for fish, and the uh, and this developed. Um, it was never a demand for, uh, for seaweed, uh, which would have meant uh, diverting labor from the, uh, from the feudal regime down to the shore. Now, once um, you get into the capitalist uh, era of the early modern and trade becomes so important, then, uh, uh, then labor is released and these regimes begin to be more mercantile and they begin to appreciate the profits from fur trade um, and, um, uh, and fishing. So that, that, is, that changes the dynamic somewhat. But I'm, I'm thinking of one case which is very interesting of the Irish famine. During the Irish famine, um, uh, the Irish living along the coast uh, were actually set up to survive by eating uh, uh, various uh, things from the shore, particularly uh, shellfish. Right. And in the wake of the famine, though, the Irish said, never again, we, we will yeah. never touch this stuff again, because it reminds us um, of our, 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 ill, um, our ill fortune during that period, although that was not the cause of their ill fortune. Uh, this left a stigma for the Irish on, uh, on that kind of cultivation. 
and they really, I don't think they've gone back to it. Uh, it they, it's coming back slowly. Okay. But, uh, but yeah. there's still this, uh, and uh, there's, um, I heard it from an Irishman saying that if people said something like, I saw you down on the foreshore yesterday, yes. Yes. it was sort of an indication that you had a sort of a situation of, of, of poverty. Yes. And on, yes. on the Ferry yes. Island, I've come across a saying yeah. that, that, that a person was put in the grave with a piece of seaweed in, in, in his mouth. Good. Lord. Which was sort yeah. of also an example of this person who yes. was dying in poverty. Good Lord, yes. Well, the, the people of the shore until the 19th century were looked upon as lesser people, as more barbaric than those who lived inland. So that, uh, that works out perfectly. In other words, the shore foods become uh, uh, a stigma. Uh, and it's not until people like you begin to write these wonderful books on the seaweeds and sushi and so on that, uh, that um, suddenly uh, everyone is, is talking about it, thinking about it, and using them and so on. It's, you're, you're really a, a pioneer. Well, what a conversation this has been. I've certainly learned a lot. And um, as, as I always do when I talk to you, Ula, um, and I'm thinking about the future now of, of COS, um, which I think are, uh, need our attention, desperately need our attention, uh, the kind of attention that we're giving right now, which is both conceptual and, uh, and practical in some ways. Uh, but I also um, uh, want to remember um, the great environmentalist Rachel Carson's um, uh, observation that ultimately, humankind will return to the shore. Now, I don't think when she wrote that in the 50s, she appreci appreciated the tsunami of, uh, of uh, colonization that was about to happen to places in California and Denmark and so on. But what she meant by that was something a little bit different than people just physically coming down to the shore. She meant, she actually used the terms to enter the sea again imaginatively. And I think that's uh, what we've been attempting to do today, is to break through some of the barriers to seeing the sea and the shore for what they, what they are, and re-envisioning the shore. And so at some point, you're going to have to come back to the shore, you're going to have to come back to God's Island, so we can uh, uh, continue this conversation, or perhaps direct it in new ways, because I'm pretty sure God's Island is going to be there, uh, at least through our lifetime. So, uh, I would love to come back and have some new recipes to try new. Excellent. Okay. Well, our door is open. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs>